wow, that's a heck of a buildup. How do I live up to that? I don't know. Well, we'll see. Is this good? All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to participate in the University of Laverne's Buto Ispahani Lecture Series. And especially honored that you're here, Dr. Ispahani. Benazir uh, Buto, another name in this uh, series, uh, was the 12th Prime Minister of Pakistan. And a few years ago, I just want to note, Pakistan awarded me the order of Hilal i Qaid i Azam, a very cherished honor, and I think their highest decoration for civilians. <laughs> Additionally, given the rich history of past lecturers that precede me, it was flattering to get the call by Professor Ambassador Juli Minoves Triquel. Juli, where is Juli? There's Juli. I want to look at him. Uh, Juli excelled in his various governmental roles at the Principality of Andorra. During my time as ambassador to Andorra and to Spain, I admire his diplomatic skills, global knowledge, and personal wisdom as Andorra's foreign minister. It's exciting to see that he has morphed, transformed, and is now blazing new personal trails in the academic world. Congratulations. Juli, it's an honor to be your friend. And let me say once again, thank you for awarding me Andorra's highest civilian decoration, the Order of Charlemagne Grand Cross. I want to thank the university for inviting my family and my friends to be here. I feel the support group. I, indeed, I, I am a family man, and uh, even though this is a very friendly crowd, it's always good to have your family standing by you and behind you. In short, I'm excited to be here today, and hopefully we will all enjoy the experience. The first half of today's lecture is structured in two sections. First, a little background on my life and professional experiences. And second, some comments on immigration. I've been told by Huli that you want to hear more about immigration, as if you don't hear enough about it. Uh, and so I'm going to oblige him on that. And then after that, uh, we should have time for a good period of questions and answers, essentially a dialogue. So I'm looking forward to that actually more than the first part. In my generation, there was a popular Beatles song that spoke of a long and winding road. For me, the past five and a half decades, as long as you've been in this university, have been a long journey over a road paved with many dreams, some pain, and above all, lots of opportunities that worked out very well. With the lively debate on immigration, I want to begin by noting that those who are born here are blessed with US citizenship at birth. Many of us, like me, like my family, on the other hand, had a choice. We were born elsewhere, but we chose to come to the United States of America. And we brought with us a burning desire to succeed coupled in many cases with the values that our families instilled in us. Respect for truth and freedom, love of God and compassion, honesty, hard work, and reverence for human life. As an immigrant, I adapted, and I was helped by the kindness of many strangers in this, my adopted homeland. Those strangers gave me the educational foundation and the ethical values to become an educated, responsible, and productive member of society. My academic and professional education allowed me, one, to enjoy a successful career in banking. Second, an unexpected career in public service. And third, a career in business consulting 
and in fact, even academia, I'm teaching a course at Texas A&M University. Over 55 years ago, I came to America from Cuba as a 15-year-old refugee with no money, no family, and certainly no knowledge of the English language. My parents courageously put me on a plane and sent me to America so that I could live in freedom. I was one of 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban kids, minors, in what became labeled Operacion Pedro Pan. For several years, I was cared for, fed, and taught through the generosity of Catholic Charities, the United Way, and many, many others. To be sure, there were hardships along the way. There were times of loneliness and despair, living in abusive orphanages, and in great boarding schools, away from my family, most importantly. During those early years, I overcame many real and imagined barriers, and in time, survived, adapted, and thrived. After high school, a very affordable loan from the US government helped me pay the way for an education at Louisiana State University, LSU. Along the way, I reunited with my brother, who's here today, in, in, and later in New Orleans with my parents, who were able to get out of Cuba. As I think back to my school years, I could not possibly have imagined that I would eventually have a successful career as a banker or become chairman of the Board of Regents at the University of Houston system or receive honorary doctorate degrees from various prestigious universities or serve in the administration of governor and later president George W. Bush. It's dry here in LA. I remember with gratitude those who gave me a helping hand, those gatekeepers or mentors who opened doors to opportunity, those who really cared. For instance, I particularly remember the second chance I was given when I was a student at LSU. I was struggling with the English language. I had terrible grades. I was, in fact, twice placed on academic probation. I had almost run out of academic options when Dean Perry, the dean of the junior division school, I call him my gatekeeper, took a chance. He listened to my circumstances, gave me one last chance to return to the university and believed in me. Inspired, I tried harder, earned solid grades, in fact, got on the dean's list, and finally earned my university degree. I'd like to say I was in the six-year program. <laughs> 10 years later, in 1977, I was befriended by then Ambassador George Herbert Walker Bush, who was fresh out of directing the CIA for President Ford. It was my good fortune that he took a liking to me. Over time, my wife and I became lifelong friends of President and Barbara Bush, as well as the extended Bush family. If Dean Perry had not given me a second chance, or President Bush had not become my political mentor, my life could have, would have, turned out quite differently indeed. Perhaps my story serves as an example of how many people in our country selflessly help immigrants to settle in America. So over my career, when I later became the gatekeeper or the mentor to others, I tried to proactively balance my responsibility, my authority, and my compassion. Upon graduating from LSU, I began a banking career. After 34 years working in several banks, I retired as president of the International Private Bank of Bank of America. There, my team was consistently acknowledged for excellence in profitability, 
customer service, regulatory compliance, and high employee satisfaction. While at the bank, I also volunteer my personal time to various causes, including serving Texas and Governor Bush in a non-paid appointment to the Board of Regents at the University of Houston System, where I became a rookie chairman of the board. After banking, I answered my country's call and served eight years in President George W. Bush's two administration. Gary and I uh, have that similar distinction. And the president appointed me to three Senate-confirmed senior-level executive positions. It was nearly 16 years ago, right, right after the September 11, 2001 attack, that I moved to Washington, D.C. and started as the head of the import, Export-Import Bank of the United States. Then, the President appointed me to be the first director of the newly established Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Department of Homeland Security. And finally, during President Bush's second administration, my wife and I moved to Spain as I was appointed the United States Ambassador to Spain and Andorra. I'd like to say I was paid for Spain, but I did Andorra for free. <laughs> L little did I dream as a young refugee boy that one day I would be serving my adopted country at such high public offices. Only in America does that happen. By naming me to three responsible positions in his administration, President Bush took a chance and underscored the fact that in the United States, there never should be second-class citizens. Native-born or naturalized, we need to have the same rights and shoulder the same responsibilities. Occasionally, I reminisce of one experience in October 2005 as the head of our nation's immigration services. And for the first time in an overseas setting, I personally naturalized some of the 40,000 immigrant men and women then serving in our armed forces. I led a team of USCIS employees to both war zones, Afghanistan and Iraq and also to Germany to fulfill the dream of American citizenship to active duty military personnel serving overseas. In 12 whirlwind days, I saw thousands of everyday American heroes who witnessed firsthand how they carried out their duty with honor and patriotism, many in harm's way, in fact, I know that some of those to whom I administered the oath of citizenship were subsequently killed in action. Like those servicemen and women, I feel truly blessed to have served the United States, my adopted country, and to live in the United States where there are no barriers to what an individual can accomplish. We live in a country where the most difficult barriers are really within us. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I promised to also focus on one specific hot topic of universal interest, immigration. And being in an academic setting, it seems to me that I need to get in the weeds and uh, talk a little bit about some of the immigration details. Perhaps that will prompt you to ask some questions to which I'll have no answers. But <laughs> We'll work it out. In the wake of the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001, the Immigration and Naturalization Service was permanently, the old INS, was permanently disbanded on February 28, 2003. INS functions were then transferred to the newly formed Department of Homeland Security and split into two main roles. Service functions went to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, uh, the, the, the bureau that I headed, 
and enforcement functions to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, known as ICE, and Customs and Border Protection, known as CBP, Enforcement Service, two different functions. As the first ever director of the newly created USCIS, my main initial challenge was to re-energize a demoralized workforce back into productivity. The subsequent objectives were to eliminate a growing backlog of applications. Look, on my first day, I found a five million application backlog. Five million were sitting in various inboxes waiting to be processed. Also, to maintain the integrity of 7 million annual adjudications within a complex legal system. In other words, USCIS receives approximately 7 million applications for immigration status, and they, they are adjudicated in what is actually the most difficult and complex legal system in our country. It competes unfavorably with tax code. Also, simultaneously implementing new elements of security and background checks to improve security aspects of immigration and processing around the world. And obviously to prevent terrorists and other criminal and undesirables from immigrating to the United States. Also, we instituted a new culture of respect, respect for both applicants and co-workers. We fundamentally transform our nation's immigration services into a more secure, efficient, and effective operation. We embrace a simple but imperative mission, making certain the right applicant receives the right benefit in the right amount of time and preventing the wrong applicant from accessing America's immigration benefits. Our core values, integrity, respect, and ingenuity, we had to re-engineer most of the processes. During my two and a half year tenure, USCIS made significant and measurable progress towards eliminating and eventually eliminating completely application backlogs, improving customer service, establishing a new brand identity, and enhancing national security. In spite of what we accomplished in those short 30 months, it's clear to me that the immigration system needs comprehensive, fundamental legislative reforms. As we know, there have been many attempts to deal with this situation by various presidents. For instance, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, known as DACA, is an immigration policy started by former President Obama in his administration in June 2012, allowing for certain immigrants who enter the country as minors to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action from deportation and eligibility for a work permit. To be eligible, undocumented immigrants must meet certain requirements, such as not to have been convicted, convicted of criminal activities, pose a threat to national security, etc. Now, if you know about DACA, and, and I suspect many of you do, the program does not provide lawful status or a path to citizenship, nor does it provide eligibility for federal welfare or student aid. The policy was created after acknowledging that these illegal aliens have been largely raised in the United States and was seen as a way to remove immigration enforcement attention for low priority individuals who act as good citizens. The undocumented alien population is rapidly increasing, approximating 65,000 illegal alien students who graduate from U.S. high schools on a yearly basis. That's a lot. 
From the start, it was estimated that up to 1.7 million people might be eligible. Over half of those applications that were accepted reside in California and in Texas. And we are in California. And I come from Texas. So I think we cover, we understand. As important as DACA is, significant and comprehensive immigration reform is needed to resolve the issues related to our existing undocumented immigrant population. When I was in government, a member of President Bush's team, on January 7, 2004, President Bush reaffirmed his desire for social reform and laid forth plans for its implementation. It was then known as the Guest Worker Program. And I know Gaddy and I spent some time thinking about that and speaking about that. This program laid out five specific goals. Protecting the homeland by protecting our borders, which included efforts to control the U.S. border through agreements with participating countries such as Mexico. Two, to serve America's economy by matching a willing worker with a willing employer. Three, promoting compassion. The program would have provided a temporary worker card to undocumented workers that would have allowed them re-entry in the United States as they travel home for family emergencies or happy events. Four, it provided incentives to return to home country at the end of the period. And five, it provided the rights of, protected the rights of legal immigrants. But it did not provide for a, a getting a green card. In other words, the legal immigrants that were here through the normal process would not have been preempted by this group. The program also contained specific agenda items for reformation of the guest worker program already in effect. The proposed program did not include a permanent legalization mechanism for guest workers. Well, in May 2006, the Senate passed a bill which included provisions for a guest worker program following the general guidelines of President Bush's proposed plan. However, no further action on the bill was taken by the controlled Republican Party House. So the bill was defeated and it evaporated. The setback was unfortunate because we came so very close to resolving a complex and emotional issue. And someone will have to deal with this sooner rather than later. My experience to immigration enforcement, which I know is of interest to many of you, is only peripheral and learned by osmosis. Nevertheless, let's review some basic facts. The government and independent observers have estimated that 11.4 million illegal immigrants live in the United States as of a couple of years ago. That would be a reduction from a peak of around 12 million just a few years earlier. In other words, the population is going down. As of last year, illegal immigration to the United States continued to decline, particularly in comparison to its peak in the year 2000. Our undocumented population, contrary to popular belief, is mixed. 52% or half from Mexico, 15% from Central America, 12% from Asia, another 6% from South America, Caribbean, another 5%, and Europe and Canada, another 5%. Economic reasons are the most popular motivation for people to illegally immigrate to the United States. In our case, it was political, but today, uh, economic reasons are the main drivers to bring in illegal immigrants into our country. The, logic, the logistical challenge to deport several million families is often not brought up 
in polite conversation. I would say to you, where would we house 11 million individuals and families who might be apporting, awaiting deportation? Where would we deport them to? Not every country would accept those deportees. How do we shelter, feed, clothe, and provide basic health and sanitary care for them? Basic logic leads me to believe that rounding up and deporting a significant percent of our undocumented immigrant population is not only impractical, but truly impossible. As you can sense, I view immigration as a highly complex, polarized, and polarizing complex, polarized, and polarizing issue in our country. And solving it will not be easy. Hopefully, you will agree with me that all of us must continue to encourage our political leaders to work together towards solving it. Now, let me conclude my remarks by saying that aside from the high honor of serving my adopted country in a challenging position as Director of Immigration Service, it was also an inspiring, intense, and exhilarating duty. Lots of daily energy and adrenaline, and I know Gaddy knows that as well, if not better than I do. America, after all, is a nation of immigrants with good-hearted, productive, law-abiding citizens originating from all parts of the world and who have made our country prosperous. Perhaps that is why I find mine to be a common immigrant story in an uncommon country, perhaps with remarkable results. And as I said at the beginning, only in America, and may God bless America, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Aguirre. We will have now a 15 minute uh, question and answer session. Um, and we will invite, of course, the first of the students uh, who will ask questions. Who wants to start? Rock and roll. Hello. Howdy. Howdy. I just wanted to ask you, I know you said your dean in college was very influential. Was there any other individual that really helped you get over the hill and uh, get to this level of success that you have been working on your whole life? You know, the, yeah, yes, uh, I hope everybody heard the question. Beyond the dean and President Bush, other <laughs> individuals, um, the list is long. And the list is long of people I know people I don't know. And what I, what I mean by that is this. Um, there was a social worker who pulled me out of uh, a very bad orphanage and put me in a very good boarding school. I remember him frequently, as a matter of fact. There were a lot of people like that. But you know, the people that I, I think about most often are those I'll, I'll never meet. Catholic Charities, the United Way, were paying my way this country until I graduated from school. And they are funded by you, charitable contributions, church donations, whatever it may be. And those people will never meet me. I certainly will never meet them, but they changed my life. So when you think about America, we're a giving country. We really are a, a generously giving country. And some of those donations 
benefited someone like me, and hopefully I'm giving back in, in, a, in a circular motion. I don't know if that answers your question. Excellent, excellent. Um, my question relates to uh, last semester we had um, Ambassador Luis Ernesto Derbez, a foreign ambassador from Mexico. He also served during uh, Bush's administrative, administra executive administration. And he talked about how between the US and Mexico, we want to implement somewhat a Schengen style passport visa interchange. I was wondering if you could share maybe if you were involved in that process or what you knew of it and how that could have changed today. Yeah, the, um, I, I'm, I'm not remembering what the name of the document is, but it's a consular document that uh, the Mexican government wanted to give and gave to their citizens in this country as a form of identification. Um, I think it's an attempt at uh, documenting undocumented people uh, which for the Mexican government makes a lot of sense. For the United States, perhaps not as much. Um, obviously, those people could also have a passport, but chose not to pursue that. Um, you know, what's the, what's the value of documentation? Documentation <coughs> is supposed to accredit you as someone who has some rights, responsibilities, or identification. If you get a driver's license, hopefully it means you can drive. Uh, someone has tested you and the laws of driving and the practicality of driving. And so, and so it goes. And passports are really the ideal form of documentation because those who hold passports from different countries are adhering to a, to a format, to a protocol to which different countries have agreed to in the Geneva Convention. So the Mexican government using the consular ID card, it's, I'm not offended by it, but I don't find it as helpful or useful as it could be. Does that answer your question? Thank you. another question here. Hello. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for such profound and insightful remarks. Um, and second, on a more contemporary note, you already touched on the issue of the backlogging of the tens of millions of people who have uh, sought for legal immigration status but have been backlogged, unfortunately. Would you say in today's pervasive rhetoric of America first and the whole isolationist approach and extreme vetting and whatnot, would that be safe to conclude that there will be an even larger backlog in today's immigrant-seeking process? Um, I left my crystal ball at home, and so I'm just going to have to guess uh, the answer to your question. Look, backlog, backlog is simply not the expedient processing of an application. And believe it or not, uh, during my time, the definition of backlog, and maybe still is, is more than six months in processing, which seems like a long time, six months. Uh, and it's a function of many things. The bureau that I headed, USCIS, had 15,000 employees. And within those 15,000 employees, I had a legal department that advised on legal issues. And we had 76 lawyers in that little bitty department. What I'm trying to say is that an application, per se, is not an easily adjudicable process. You have to analyze it, you have to match it up against the law, you have to compare. Uh, in some cases, it is not properly filled out. You gotta set it back, you gotta come back. So it's a mess, okay? It's a mess. Uh, just by definition, it's a mess. on perfect conditions, it's a mess. Uh, you get 500, 600,000 applications coming in every month. So. The USCIS Department Bureau is responsible for allocating personnel around their, their world, and some of that allocation is guided by presidential policy. 
executive branch policy. So if you're getting a lot of applications and you really want them processed on this side, you move people there, and by definition, you move them out of somewhere else. So uh, I know that the next director of USCIS will have to balance the efficacy of the process with the directives that he or she may be getting. It's a he, I know, uh, already been named. Uh, he will be getting from the White House and from the head of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Bottom line is, how would I know? Uh, I mean, really. But I know that no one in USCIS wants to delay processing applications. They're good people that are trying to do a job, career people that are trying to do a job. And I, you know, I thought very, very highly of them. And they're sometimes, you know, they have a job that starts at 8 in the morning and they need to go home to their children at 5 in the afternoon. And the last application gets processed and the next one is processed next. So uh, bottom line is, look, we are blessed and cursed as a United States of America by a lot of people wanting to come. And it's a blessing, but it is a curse in processing. Actually, I wish to uh, piggyback off of my uh, colleague's uh, question very slightly. Um, in regards to the backlog, uh, how would, legally speaking, uh, illegal immigration make it more difficult for those who maybe take the time to uh, attempt to immigrate here legally? How do those actually come into conflict, um, and how does that make it more difficult for UC, uh, uh, MIC, or uh, the individuals attempting to? Got it. Uh, they're, they're actually, they, they, they can be harmonious. Um, it takes a little creativeness, but it can be harmonious. Um, if, you, if you think of the 11 million illegal uh, immigrants that are in this country, uh, and you try to process them, and you find them, you find them $1,000. Well, $1,000 times 11 million, it's a lot of money. A whole lot of money. And that would fund digital and data processing features that do not exist today. You see? You know, if you look at the digitalization of the processes, we've gone from, you know, getting ink in your fingerprints and putting them in cards to digital processing, to facial recognition, to any number of different things that speed up the process. So one of our uh, premises when we tried to pass the law that I described was that there would be a fine associated with those who were here illegally, a, a practical fine. Uh, you know, it could be $2,000, it could be $500, I don't know. But the sheer numbers made it a mountain of money, which we could in turn immediately uh, utilize to bring equipment and, and systems that would help everybody. You follow me? Follow up. This is like the press conference. <laughs> Come on, chair, man. Three more questions, and then we will uh, close the meeting. Please. Hi, my name is Ross Dillon. I'm a freshman here at the University of Laverne. Uh, my question is directly because I was very interested in the delineation you made between the service aspect of immigration and the uh, enforcement aspect. My question pertains more towards the service aspect and more specifically towards refugee status. So in the United States, in terms of refugee status, which is dealt by the Department of Homeland Security, State Department, it seems to have a lot of scrutiny on, as it pertains to refugees in comparison to other countries. For example, 
uh, a refugee you know, has to go through the UN, has to go through all these bureaucratic organizations, and then when it comes to the US finally, it has to go through a series of organizations, 12 to be more specific, such as the FBI, Homeland Security, all that. And now even there's further proposal for scrutiny, such as the FBI director, they have to you know, by hand select and approve every single refugee that has to be approved. Like there's a very high degree of scrutiny. Uh, my question is two parts in the essence of, firstly, like is there an appropriate justification for this level of scrutiny? And secondly, comparatively to other immigration policies of places such as Germany that are very, I don't want to use the word liberal, but less scrutinous of immigration. Use the word. <laughs> Yeah, well, more liberal in regards to immigration acceptance of refugees. Uh, would that type of policy function well within the infrastructure of immigration within the U.S.? I got your question. Thank you. Um, several levels uh, impact the outcomes that you're referring to. First, first uh, factor is that the Congress sets the number of refugees that we can accept at any given year. And it's a very modest number. Oh, that's all small. Uh, I don't remember that was 75,000, and there's an attempt to lower that as well. In the world we live in today, I call that woefully short. But that's irrelevant. How you feel about the number of refugees can only be impacted by the law. One thing we all do in the U.S. government, and Gary knows this well, is you raise your hand and you take a moment to protect and defend da -da -da -da, and the laws of the United States. So if the law says I can only process 50,000 or 75,000, that's all I'm going to do. I may cry on the 70. 5,001 that I have to pass up, but that doesn't make it different. Second, refugees are uh, exceptionally well vetted by the USCIS team and by the State Department. And for everyone that we accept, hundreds, thousands don't make the cut. That could make the cut, but you know, we, we make a very strict uh, process to determine that we're letting in people that are worthy of of the uh, benefit. And so uh, I know that the administration right now is um, is concerned about uh, refugees, the refugee population. Uh, I am concerned, but I'm not sure we, our concerns are commensurate with each other. Uh, so. I don't know how else to answer your question. It's the law has to be changed to allow for more, not for less. And then the process doesn't need to be tweaked any further. The process is pretty strong as it is. And the FBI is involved in every one of the processes that USCIS makes, not just refugees. We, we my old team, uh, runs each applicant any applicant through about 11 checkpoints of uh, security and and very few very few uh, skip that that is no, no one right. the last question then. last question uh, that lady in the back hello my name is Alison Sant and thank you very much for your insight today I was hoping to learn a little bit more about your personal experience. Many of us think of the refugees and the immigrants who come here are plagued with a bit of discrimination, whether from the U.S. government or from their social interactions. Have you ever experienced discrimination, whether as your time during your student life, or your like, young professionalism, or during your time in the conservative party? And do you think that would change within this conservative party? I didn't hear the question. <laughs> Look, I'm wired optimist. I bet you that I have been discriminated against. I just never knew it. <laughs> Guess what? Uh, 
it, it never, never even occurred to me that I was being discriminated, but I bet I was. Uh, that, that's not something that concerns me. You know, my wife will say, oh, look what you're doing. Somebody will think of it. So be it. Uh, I live in my own little uh, space in that sense. But, but, uh, but I understand the issue of discrimination. And I understand the issue of discrimination on any number of... Look, I discriminated in favor of this tie today. I had two. I brought two. And I discriminated in favor of this one. But that's not illegal. Now, what is illegal is discrimination against, and you know the numbers. So, as a country, we need to make sure, particularly law enforcement, does not forget the law on what is appropriate and what is not appropriate in terms of discrimination. Does that answer your question? Great. Hey, okay. We're coming to the end. Uh, you here with us and your family. Uh, we'll be honored to have you with us. Thank Good. you so much. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Huli. See y'all.